right, so hi everyone. My name is Ellie. I am here on behalf of Cohere for AI. Uh, welcome to our latest edition of Technical Talks. Uh, today I'm welcoming Tim Detmers here to talk about 8-bit methods for efficient deep learning as we get the slides up and ready to go. Uh, a little bit about Tim. He's a PhD student at the University of Washington. Uh, he's working on representation learning and neuro-inspired and hardware-optimized deep learning. Uh, he previously interned at the UCL Machine Reading Group. He was working on information retrieval and link prediction in knowledge graphs. And main research thesis is that computationally efficient methods will accelerate and enable progress in an understanding of deep learning. Uh, we were just talking before we came on live about how quickly everything is accelerating in AI these days. Uh, so this feels like a particularly timely topic. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes before we get underway. Uh, the session is being recorded. Uh, we will be posting this on the Cohere for AI uh, YouTube playlist in about a week or so. Uh, so if there's something that you miss as we're going through this, don't worry, we've got you covered. Um, if you have questions for Tim as well about the presentation, uh, please use the Q&A button. It should be at the very bottom of your screen. Please use that to submit questions. Uh, we will have time for some Q&A at the end of the presentation, uh, and we'll try to fish out uh, relevant uh, questions as we go. Uh, so that's enough talking for me. Thanks everyone for joining. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Tim. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Ellie. Um, yeah, so so today I present on eight methods for efficient deep learning. Um, th things are moving very, very fast. So maybe the title should be K-bit methods because we're going lower than eight bits. But um, here I present um, work uh, which main motivation is like making large models more accessible. If you look at sort of existing open source uh, models and, and um, more recently also Llama kind of open source, um, they use quite a bit of memory both for inference and fine tuning. And so uh, in my work, I try to quantize large models to make them more accessible. And so that re reduce uh, memory footprint considerably. And then we achieve some milestones where you can run model on hardware, on consumer hardware that you couldn't do before. And so in this uh, talk, I will talk about four different uh, uh, papers. And um, that is like one about a specific data type, um, one about 8-bit optimizers. Then there is LLM and 8 that allows uh, efficient inference in 8-bit for, la from, for large transformers. And then my most recent work that is um, K-bit inference scaling laws, where we show that 4-bit is actually really good for inference. And so before I jump into all these uh, papers, um, I want to give you a little bit of background. So this is mostly about quantization. So I want to give you a little bit of background about quantization. So what is quantization? Quantization is if we have um, a floating point or a real representation, we want to quantize into buckets. And that's very similar to histogram binning. So here you have a histogram of a normal distribution and the histogram has 16 bins. That's uh, basically a four bit quantization. And if you have linear quantization, it means integer quantization. Uh, you can see it as a histogram where the width of each bin is equal you slice up the normal distribution in equal parts, each with the same width. And then you take the middle value of each bin and you quantize all the values within this bin to the middle value. And that's how you get um, a four bit quantization, a four bit integer quantization. Now you can have other data types, which are sort of nonlinear. That means that the width of each bin uh, can be different for each um, for each, each particular bin. So maybe you want to have um, smaller bins uh, around zero and larger bins at, at, the, at the edges so that you um, quantize where there are more values in the middle. Um, you have like a more a, a different, different representations for that. And so based on where you choose um, the bin width to be larger or smaller, um, that's how you can control where you get basically high precision and where you get errors. Um, if you see the bars basically overlapping, um, sort of sticking out of the normal distribution, that's that's a representation of how much error is in this bin. And so, um, yeah, there are different ways how you can reduce the error based on how you choose your bins. 
um, to sort of formalize it a little bit more, um, we can look at uh, integer for, in four data type and floating point four data type. Um, here I uh, have given you a part of it. So um, these contain 15 values and I only gave you five. But um, sort of if we would want to generalize it into a single mathematical form, what we want to do is normalize it into the range minus one, one. And so then these um, basically values become um, comparable and uh, with a single implementation that maps from the index to a particular value in the range of minus one, one, we can represent any data type. And um, so usually this mapping is done through um, dividing by the absolute maximum value. Um, and so that normalizes us into the range minus one, one. And um, if we then want to quantize a certain value, we can just uh, find the closest value that's in this uh, list of uh, quantized values between minus one, one. And then we take the index as a representation, as a bit representation for the data type. Um, that might sound a little bit confusing. Let, let's go through an example just to make it clear. Um, just um, to uh, basically highlight that this is very general. I have a non-standard two-bit uh, data type. So um, you see the index 0, 1, 2, 3, and then the data type from minus one to one. And this time we have like 0. 0.3 and 0. 0.5. So it's non-symmetric. And now we have an input tensor 10 minus three, five, four. And so to quantize, we follow the, the, the these four steps. First, we normalize by the absolute maximum value. The absolute maximum value is 10. So we divide all the elements in the tensor by 10. With that, we get the tensor into the minus one, one range. Then we find the closest value from this um, new tensor, from this normalized tensor to the values that we have in our quantization map, uh, which is also called the codebook. And um, there we find uh, basically maps to 1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and 0.5. And now these values have an associated index that we can also look up in the dictionary in the map. And so we find 3122. We store that. And that's our quantized two bit representation of the input tensor. If we want to dequantize it, we load the index 3122, do a lookup which values they represent. So we just index the values in the quantization map. And then it's uh, 1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And now we need to denormalize. So we uh, multiply by the absolute maximum value to reverse the first operation. And so then uh, we basically recover the dequantized value. And in this case, you see we have a large error. So the minus three turns into a three. And this basically means our quantization data type was not good for this input. Um, and that is sort of a big consideration. If you do quantization, what data types do you use? How do you construct your data type? Um, just to sort of demonstrate this further, um, if you look at floating point data types, they're made um, of three parts. One bit is for the sign. Then you have seven bits and they can distribute it uh, in different ways. You can have exponent bits, which are basically two times uh, the power of an exponent. Um, and the exponent is basically an int, so two to the power of an integer represented by the exponent. And then we can have the fraction, um, which is um, the fractional part. Um, and so we multiply the exponent by the fractional part to then get a floating point number. And so um, if we have this, we can, for example, take more exponents for uh, more bits for the exponents. And that helps you to approximate large numbers well and very small numbers well. But because your fraction has relatively few bits, um, you don't get as high of a precision for certain numbers. You can also allocate more bits for the fraction and then you get um, high precision for values, but now your exponent is very small and you cannot approximate a good range of numbers. And so depending on the inputs, certain uh, combination of exponents and fractions is best. And um, what we later see, especially in 8-bit optimizers, um, certain times we need to make certain trade-offs that are more complicated. And so um, what I designed um, is a data type that has a dynamic exponent, and it works like this. So it still has three parts, 
and the exponent, the fraction, and the sign, but now it has an extra part, an indicator bit. And so um, how it works is um, you have a sign bit, then the first zero bits indicate the exponent, and then the first bit that is a one is an indicator bit. And this indicator bit indicates that all following bits are for the fraction. And so what you can do with this indicator bit, as you slide it from left to right, you can determine how much, how many bits you use for the exponent and how many bits you use for the fraction. And so what this data tape allows is you can approximate very large and small values well, and you can uh, approximate um, very large values with high precision. Where this data type is not good is sort of intermediate values that have intermediate size and, and um, then the precision is low. And so um, th this is the data type I developed and that will be later important for ABIT optimizers, which actually follows now. And so um, if we have any questions um, so far for the background, let me know. I can answer them as I go through the next slides. Um, but yeah, we talk now about ABIT optimizers. And so the main motivation is if you look at training, uh, we have this setup. We have the input gradients, which depend on the model size, but also other factors like the sequence length, so the batch size. But then we have some memory that's just determined by the model size. And these are the weights, the gradients, uh, the main weights, if you have mixed precision training, and then atom optimizer states. Uh, if you use, if you do a language modeling, often you have used the atom optimizer. The atom optimizer has two buffers, and each buffer is just as large as the weight. And usually, the optimizer states are 32 bit, so um, they take up quite some bits of memory. And so, with 8 bit optimizers, we can reduce it by approximately 40 percent. So now we reduce the 32 atom buffers to um, 8 bit, and then they are much smaller. And so that saves a lot of memory. And so um, um, if we try this, this doesn't quite work. And why doesn't it work? Um, we have outliers in our atom buffers. And so it looks a little like this. So here you have, again, again a 16, um, 16 value uh, histogram. So a two bit quantization. But now you have an outlier at minus 10. And so what it does, because we have absolute maximum normalization, is basically you have a bin with a single value at minus 10, and then all the bins up to minus three are empty, and then the other bins are sort of filled. And so what it basically does is a lot of bits are wasted because they don't have any values. Only certain bit values have um, uh, uh, basically values allocated to them. And so this increases the error. So, so this is basically no longer um, um, a four bit quantization. It's more close to a three bit quantization. And so you basically lose a bit of representation if your data type isn't well aligned with outliers. And so to overcome this problem, what we do is we, um, we uh, chunk the atom states into blocks and we treat each block independently and quantize it independently. And so if an outlier is in a certain block, then it will have an effect on the absolute maximum value and with that on the quantizations. But because everything is independent, the other blocks will be unaffected. So with this, we can isolate problems of outliers into particular blocks. And so the smaller the block size, the more we can isolate outliers and with this, APID optimizers become much more stable. And so um, to put everything together um, with if you have these blocks and we learned already about quantization and we use this uh, dynamic quantization data type that introduced. So um, um, what you basically do is um, if you want to update an uh, optimizer state, um, you have the state, you chunk it into blocks you find the absolute maximum value, norm normalize it by it, find the closest 8-bit value, exactly like in our example. Now you find the index, and now you can store it in 8-bit. And if you want to dequantize it, you will basically reverse the steps. Uh, you take the index values, uh, undo the normalization, undo the uh, blockwise normalization, and then you have the optimizer states that you can update again. And so you repeat this loop over and over. And with that, basically, you have an 8-bit optimizer that is very compact 
uh, but um, that is actually as good as a 32-bit optimizer. So this is a very large table, lots of results, probably very confusing. Uh, the main takeaway here is, so we have like um, glue, we have image net classification, we have machine translation, we have um, image net pre-training, we have language modeling multiple, and we have mass language modeling. And for all of these, we basically replicate 32-bit performance with 8-bit optimizers. So we can reduce the memory footprint on the very right column quite considerably, and at the same time, get the same performance. And it's also a little bit faster, which is sort of a little bit of added bonus. Um, yeah, and so 8-bit um, optimizers work. Um, and um, if we sort of ablate the components, we find that we need everything that we sort of introduced, the dynamic uh, exponent data type, we need blockwise quantization, then also um, stable embedding layers, which is sort of more described in the paper. Um, but yeah, with that we can have 8 bit optimizer states, and that makes fine tuning much more accessible. Uh, 8 bit optimizers are widely used for people that have a single GPU, in particular if they want to fine tune, for example, stable diffusion. I'll maybe just pop in here for a second because we do have a question before we yeah. go on to the next one. Um, is the computation efficient on mapping onto hardware for non standard data types? So yes, um, it is relatively efficient. So, so um, what you want to do is basically, if you have APID optimizers, is um, you dequantize the values in cache and then do the operations in 32-bit or 16-bit in cache. And that's relatively fast. The only overhead is the dequantization. And so the dequantization is basically a lookup. So if you have your index, um, like here, uh, so here we have basically the step four, that's the main overhead. Quantization in cache is very fast, but if you dequantize, uh, if you load the value and dequantize, that's a little bit slower. And so what do you want to do is basically a lookup. And a lookup, if you have parallel hardware, can be quite complicated. So basically you do a lookup in a table of 256 values. And that's how you do dequantization. And that's a little bit slow on uh, GPUs. But as we see, um, 8-bit optimizers are still faster than 32-bit optimizer. And so, um, yeah, there's a little bit of overhead, but um, because you have also a smaller memory footprint, you actually gain also some speed. And so overall, there's speed ups there. So we have a couple more questions. Maybe I can quickly yeah. go through them. And so um, the absolute maximum values are stored with the 8-bit uh, tensor. So you need the 8-bit tensor and the absolute maximum values. And so you need to do both to do the de dequantization. Um, but the absolute maximum values are relatively small. So you have like one value in four, and you have a block size of 4,000. So every 4,000 elements in a matrix has one absolute maximum value. So they're relatively small, can be loaded quickly. Um, exactly. So um, um, the question is, um, if you don't lose accuracy, um, does it mean we just don't need 32 bits? The answer is yes. Um, we, uh, as I show in the next paper, um, we can get away with eight bits for inference. Um, I follow up work where we show you can get also away with eight bit during training, and you can actually also get four bits or lower during inference. And um, um, uh, work that probably comes out in the next couple of weeks, we also show you can fine tune in four bits. So without losing precision. So neural networks don't need super high precision. Uh, at the end of the talk, I also have more information about this. Um, but let me dive into the next project. This is LLM and date. And this is allows you to do inference on consumer GPUs um, more efficiently. So if you have OPT 175 billion, which is the largest open source model, or now also Llama 65 billion, these are quite big models and it's difficult to sort of fit them on a single machine. And so if you need multiple machines, you need to have fast networking, that's very expensive. Eight GPU machines are very expensive. Consumer cheap machines have usually four GPUs. And, that, and so um, if we can get away with less memory, we can sort of hit these milestones of having um, inference on a single machine with eight GPUs or even on a single machine with four GPUs. 
For example, uh, with this method, it's easy to do um, Llama inference on four GPUs. So you can do it on a single consumer machine. And so, um, yeah, um, as I said, um, if we compress things, we can have, um, with 8-bit, we can have the model in, on one machine. It's just half the size. And um, if we have sort of a little bit smaller model like Llama, we can fit it on four GPUs, which is a consumer machine. And so um, the first thing that we did in the project is uh, we took the best 8-bit method, eight method for quantization in the literature and we applied it. And so what you here see is a shot of um, the model size on the x-axis and then zero shot um, accuracy um, across uh, a couple of zero shot tasks. And um, you see the 16-bit baseline in green, that just increases. Um, so the larger the model, the better. But now an 8-bit method, uh, um, it's the best 8-bit method works quite well, but then at 6.7 billion, the performance drops dramatically. And then the performance drops further to random performance, basically, uh, from 13 billion parameters. And so something is wrong um, at this mark of 6.7 billion parameters. And this was the main problem in the project that we tackled. We our, what we tackled was basically find out what is going on there, then fix it, and, and get full 16-bit performance. And that's what we do in this paper. And so what we found is the main problems are outliers. Again, similar to the 8-bit optimizer papers, outliers are a big problem. But outliers are also important. You cannot just remove them. And so just to highlight what happens if you have outliers. So here we, I have um, basically, you can see it as a hidden dimension in the weight or in the input space. And I put one outlier that I sort of almost double with every iteration. And so if you quantize this vector um, with the same quantization method, then um, if your outlier value is too large and you have some small values in your vector, at some point they will be quantized to zero. And so zero multiplied by the absolute maximum value is always zero. So you basically lose that information. It's just lost, it's gone. And so the larger the outlier, the more information is gone. So on the right, we see how many values are quantized to zero. And so um, if you have larger outliers, more and more values are quantized to zero. That means if we have very large outliers, um, a lot of information is just quantized to zero. We lose that information. And this information uh, is important. And uh, then our model no longer works. And if we have too many zeros, we get random performance because the important information is just gone. And so what we find for large models is that at 6.7 billion, the outliers reach a magnitude of 60. And then a lot of values are quantized to zero. And this is the main problem. And to highlight sort of what it looks like to find um, um, these outliers. And um, so, so, so the most interesting part of this project is we found outliers that are highly systematic. They are sort of emergent, they come with scale. And at small models, they're almost invisible. But sort of as you scale up, they become more and more and more invisible. And at some point they're obvious, but um, they haven't been detected before because it's not quite easy to sort of find them in the first place. But if you know what you're looking for, they're very easy to find. And so this is a view of what it looks like if you look um, at these um, outliers. So here we have uh, basically an input batch. And we have on the x-axis the hidden or feature dimension. And in the y-axis, we have the sequence dimension. And so usually, because we have layer normalization, we would expect um, a normal distribution. So you expect um, values that are approximately normal distributed, like on the left. In the right, you see already some larger values, minus 3, minus 6, and minus 7. And so as we scale up, these values become uh, larger and larger, and the probability increases. So in the beginning, it was just 1.5% of values would be this large with the outlier on the right column. Um, and 98.5%, it was just fine, just a normal distribution. And so as we scale up, these outliers become larger and more common. 
And then if we hit 6.7 billion, suddenly almost all the mini batches have outliers. The outliers are minus 40 to minus 60. And now it's rare to have a normal distribution with where everything is normal. So uh, instead we find we have a normal distribution with just one column having very large outliers. And um, sort of these columns also increase uh, with the model size. Um, so at 6.7 billion, there are six columns in the transformer that have outliers. And the interesting thing is these happen in the same dimension for every layer in a transformer. So if you find these outliers in the first layer, you can say, you can point to layer 30 and say like the outliers will be there and you find them exactly at that spot. And um, yeah, the interesting thing is once the phase shift happens, the, prob uh, the proportions no longer increase. Like 75% of inputs will have outliers. The magnitude slightly increases. But if you look at the jump from like 6 billion to 6.7, uh, where the phase shift happens, it triples and then it stays relatively constant. And so um, after this phase shift, something happens and it stays there. Um, and so if we do look at the overall data and um, how it is analyzed, um, here's what we see. We have two plots. On the left, we have um, a plot with parameter and billions on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, we have the percentage of layers um, uh, or tokens that are affected. And so in uh, blue, we have the number of layers affected. And in orange, we have the number of tokens affected. So if you pick a random layer in the transformer or a random token in the input sequence, what is the proportion or the probability that um, this will be affected. And as you see, um, if you have small networks uh, in blue, few layers are affected. But if you hit this phase shift, 100% of layers are affected. All the layers are affected all the time. And um, this continues with scale. And it continues for very different models. We tried uh, lots of different models, uh, FairSeq models, OPT models. Uh, we looked at blue models and um, we see it in all models. It's a general thing. Uh, in orange, we see the number of tokens affected and also they sort of peak at 75%, roughly 75% and they stay there. Um, on the right, um, so on the left, it looks like this phase shift, something, something subtly changed. But if we look uh, in terms of perplexity, uh, which is logarithmic, we see actually the trend is a smooth exponential. So it's a smoothly exponential increasing function. So this property of outliers uh, increases exponentially, but at some point the exponential grows so quickly that it looks like a phase shift. And that's uh, also one main takeaway. You can detect emergence in transformers by looking at exponential trends. And um, this is basically how outliers emerge. Once they're emerged, they um, remain stable. And the other thing, as I showed before, the magnitude increases rapidly at some point. And this is actually exactly the point that um, causes these large quantization errors. And that makes uh, the APIT uh, method not work. It makes it break down. The APIT method cannot deal with outliers. And so um, what we did after looking at all of this data is we found like, okay, there are these outliers, but there are very few of them. They're highly systematic because it's just columns. We just need to find these columns. And what we do is we multiply the columns in 16-bit and all other values in 8-bit. And so all the other values in 8-bit are 99.9% .9 and only 0.1% is um, our outliers, which we multiply in 16-bit. So we have uh, one matrix multiplication for the outliers in 16-bit, one matrix multiplication for the non-outliers in 8-bit, then we add them together. And if we do that, um, we get our main output from the matrix multiplication. And so um, this is still very efficient because 99.9% .9 of weights are still in 8-bit. We just need to store a couple of 16-bit weights. And uh, with that, we have full 8-bit matrix multiplication. And so um, if we again look at the graph, um, now we have in blue our method, LLL in eight, 
uh, where we do the sort of decomposition in 8-bit and 16-bit. And there we see we replicate the full performance. Now our model is just as good as 16-bit, but it has 8-bit weights. And so it has half the memory size. And so that makes these models much more accessible. And that is how LLM int 8 works. Um, here's a shot of um, memory footprints, uh, different kind of hardware setups, and then the largest model that you can fit. And so as we can see, um, if you have the free cloud, um, I, I think they're no longer free. I think Kaggle is still free, but Colab is no longer free. But um, at that point, it was still free and you can fit easily a T5 model with 11 billion parameters on the free cloud. Um, a paid cloud, um, 13 billion, um, yeah. And so um, if you have an academic desktop with the best consumer GPUs, you can fit OPT 66 billion or basically now Llama 65 billion. So um, that, that makes Llama models extremely accessible. You no longer need a server. You can have a desktop and do it. So um, the evaluation, so and we have a question about few shot performance. So this, this um, oh, I see, few shot, um, few shot, is uh, basically very similar to zero shot. We see, um, so one very interesting finding from this analysis is also we compared zero shot performance and perplexity on language modeling. We find that the correlation is minus 0.95, which basically means if you evaluate a language model on perplexity, you basically get its zero shot performance. And it's actually similar for K-shaped shot performance. So. You don't need to evaluate a language model on zero shot. You just need to evaluate on complexity if you want to compare two language models or two approaches. And so um, K-sharp performance is also basically the same as 16-bit. So um, we have another question. What does affected mean in the context of tokens and layers affected? So this means basically, yeah, the criterion that we have um, basically for this it's a little bit more complicated, um, but um, the or, or the motivation is complicated. But the criterion that we use in this paper is uh, we set a threshold of six and say um, um, a dimension has an outlier if it has a value larger than six, because we have layer normalized values. Um, if you have a normal distribution and a value of six, the probability should be tiny, it should be like 0.0001% or something like that. And so by chance, you wouldn't expect such large values. And we say like, if we see such a large value, we say this dimension has an outlier. And as I said, there are very few outliers. So if you have like 3 billion parameters, there are like two or three outliers. If you have 12 billion parameters, there are seven outliers or seven outlier dimensions. So very few dimensions, highly concentrated, highly systematic. A uh, percentage of outliers um, um, above 6.7 per, yeah, I, I guess I answered that just now. So if you have larger models, they're a little bit more, but it doesn't grow uh, quickly. Um, it's um, a couple more outliers. And in some models, you see people report, oh, I found in my model, there are lots of outliers. For example, an OPT 66 billion is actually very unstable. And um, its standard deviation um, increases with the depth, which is very unusual. And so if you find more outliers if you have this criterion on threshold six. But in uh, the follow-up work, we have actually a better criterion, which again, finds just a handful of outliers in these models. And um, I can talk a bit more about that a little bit later. So the inference speed question, the implementations that I have for this paper were designed for training, for 8-bit training, not in 8-bit inference. So this is an 8-bit training project that turned into an 8-bit inference project. And that's why the implementations are a little bit slow. But if you implement it right, you get a speed up of basically two for inference. Um, insights, why outliers are clustered in a single column? That seems counterintuitive, yes. So, um, one important thing is that um, if you want to attend to sort of a single thing, 
because attention comes basically from the same inputs. So you take an input, you separate it to key, query, and value, and now you do attention. And if you want to, to pay attention to a single value, now you basically need to separate everything. You need to have a sparse output from a linear projection. That's very difficult to achieve in a context-dependent manner. And so what the language model needs to learn in order to do this efficiently is to have some values that are context independent. And this is what kind of happens with the outliers. So if you look more closely at the outliers, um, most outliers are in the beginning of sequence token because it's independent of all inputs because all input sequences have the beginning of sequence token. And they are aligned in a way that it cancels out exactly those features that are not needed. So it basically helps with sparse attention. And I think I have also, no, I don't have it here. Um, in the paper, we also talk about how much performance you lose um, if you remove these outliers in attention in particular. And so these outliers, they make up most of the probability mass in attention. So really important for attention. And that's why you see them sort of in single columns. Um, that way it's easy for the attention to cancel out values because it's predictable. If you want to cancel out a value and you know where an outlier is, you can have the appropriate sign basically set the softmax to zero for that dimension. Okay, uh, I think we have one more question. Um, does the impact of APIT training depend on activation function used for the sigmoid? So um, yeah, this paper is mostly about APIT in, uh, inference, but I have results on APIT training. So what I tried in particular for activation functions is the softmax in the attention layer because the attention layer is very unstable for APIT training. And so um, there, if you have different activation functions, they are much more stable. So um, if uh, it's the same thinking like um, we will replace sigmoid function with rectified linear units because they have easier gradients. And um, yeah, they are, they are, if you have a sigmoid and you want to saturate it, your gradients get extremely large. And so that can cause instabilities. And so if you replace sigmoids with rectified linear units, you fix this. And so I wanted to do the same by replacing the softmax with the equivalent of a rectified linear unit that is basically an arc, uh, what do you call an arc max, a soft arc max. And so if I do that, I get much stable, more stable training, but performance drops. So that is the main problem. Our activation functions that we have, they're critical for performance. And if you change them, you increase the stability, but you um, decrease training performance. And so that is sort of a difficult trade off in research. Often the methods that you work on they improve stability, but they degrade performance. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's sort of an active part of research, figuring out how to overcome that. Okay, uh, let me go on to the next uh, project. And that's a very recent project. And that also inspired a follow-up project that, that I think uh, will be uh, quite important. And so, um, this project is about the question, if you take um, an 8-bit uh, language model in 30, with 30 billion parameters and a 4-bit model with 16 billion parameters, they have the same number of bits. One has more parameters and uh, lower precision. One has uh, less parameters and higher precision. But overall, you have the same bits. And the curious thing about these language models is the inference uh, latency, so how long it takes to do an inference, is the same. And why is it the same? It's because for GPUs, um, computation is very cheap, but loading memory is very expensive, um, uh, particular for inference. And so modern GPUs can do 200 multiplications in the same time it takes to just use uh, load one element. So uh, basically computation is 200 times cheaper than uh, loading memory. And if we look at, look at the memory that is used during inference, I have here a representation for GPT-3, I think it is. Uh, on the left, you see a single pixel that represents the size of the memory due to the inputs, the input token. And on the right, you see the memory due to the weight matrix. And now if loading 
memory is much more expensive than computation, then loading the weight matrix is much, much, much more expensive than loading the inputs. And so basically all the latency in inference um, basically is due to loading the weight matrix. So if you compress the rate matrix by a factor of two, you get a speed of, of two. And that's basically why the total number of bits in all weight matrices determine how fast your model is. And if you have this, the natural question is, if you have, a, if you have two different models with the same number of bits, which one is better? Higher precision and fewer parameters or more parameters and lower precision? And that's what I study in this, in this paper. And uh, we do a very thorough study we do 35,000 zero-shot experiments on a couple of data sets. We look uh, between uh, 19 million and actually 175 billion parameters. We look across different models, OPT, Bloom, Blooms, Pythia, NeoAx, GPT-2. We look um, from three bit to eight bit precision. We skip two bit because there we get random performance. Uh, we introduced blocking already before. We look at how um, block size improves performance. And then we look at four different data types, integer, float, the dynamic exponent already introduced, and another data type, quanta quantization, which is information theoretically optimal. And this is our setup. So we try to find out if we have the same number of bits, what's the bus model we can get? How many bits does it have per parameter? And this is basically also a question very closely to related, like how much information um, is there per parameter per bit? And um, this is the answer. Um, so here we have a plot. On the x-axis, we have the total model bits uh, um, in, in these models. And we use models, OPT models from 125 million to 175 billion. And on the uh, y-axis, we have mean zero-shot accuracy across four or five tasks, I think it was. And now we have four curves. In um, red-orange, we have, or reddish, we have 16-bit. And now you have different positions uh, in 8-bit uh, and green, and, and yellow 4-bit and blue 3-bit. And we can see actually 4-bit is more efficient. So if you have a 60 billion model in 4-bit, it's better than a 30 billion model in 8-bit. So what this plot says is basically, you want if you want to have the most efficient model with a fixed size, you want to use the largest model that you can fit in 4-bit. And that is sort of the answer. If we look at 3-bit, what we see is performance degrades. The model becomes unstable. It's very jagged. And this jaggedness basically means that um, instabilities were encountered similar to before in LLM and 8. And now the performance drops to um, a very low level, even random level for some, for some models. And so um, one natural question is, if we fix these issues in 3-bit, is 3-bit better than 4-bit? And so we use a similar technique like in LLM and 8 called proxy quantization, where we find the outliers and isolate them. And we do them in 16-bit instead of 3-bit. Um, and so here you see the curve um, blue in 3-bit and a yellow 3-bit plus proxy quantization. So there the outliers are considered. And what we see is 4-bit is still better. So 3-bit plus considering outliers is not better than 4-bit. 4-bit is optimal. And if we um, use 4-bit plus outliers, it also has no benefit. So um, basically, 4-bit is the best method we can have. Um, you don't need to consider outliers. And uh, I mean, well, what I should have said uh, before is the inputs in this case are still 16-bit because it's a small. We can have them a high precision because almost the entire um, inference latency is due to the model size, uh, to the weights, uh, the size of the weights. We have the weights in four bits and the inputs in 16 bit. And so, yeah, if we look at k-bit weights, four bits is best. Um, and so if we have a setup, we can also study um, how to improve this further. So now we know four bit models are best. If you have a fixed size or a fixed budget for uh, inference latency, you should always use four bits. 
but can we do better? And so if you look at block size, if we decrease the block size, we have basically more quantization statistics. The more quantization statistics we have, the larger the bit footprint per parameter. So for example, if we have um, uh, quantization statistics with 32-bit floats and a block size of 32, then we add one bit per parameter. And so here we have a block size of 64 and quantization statistics of 16-bit. So we add 0.25 bits per parameter. And so if we trade off these things, what we see is that a block size, a smaller block size of 64 is better than larger block sizes. And at 64, we're almost at the optimum. 32 doesn't have any benefit. And so, um, yeah, what we want to use is 4-bit small block size. And this improves things further. Can we even go beyond that? And so for that, we can further look at data types. What data types are good for 4-bit quantization? And so um, I introduced this dynamic exponent data type. And we have a normal integer data type. These don't do so well. And then we have two other data types, a floating point data type, a four bit float. And then we have um, the information theoretically optimal data type, this quantile. And these two data types perform better. So what do you want to use is basically four bits, a small block size, and either float or the information theoretically optimal data type. And um, yeah, this you get the best performance. And that is what I have uh, for this talk. So um, I talked about 8-bit optimizers um, and that makes training and fine tuning um, more accessible. Um, uh, it, it's used uh, particularly with stable diffusion models and it's integrated in the bits and bytes library. The library now has uh, more than 20,000 pip installs per day. So it's widely used. Um, mostly for the 8-bit optimizer. But then I also presented LLM and 8, and that makes it possible to have large models and use them on a single machine. Uh, for example, you can have now a single server and do OPT 175 billion inference, or a single um, desktop computer and do LAMA 65 billion inference. Um, and then finally, I showed like, if we analyze sort of different k-bit position for inference, we actually find 4-bit is the optimal position. If you want to optimize your inference latency or your memory footprint, always go for 4-bit. That's, that's the most efficient. And um, yeah, that's, that's what I have. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to take more questions. All right. Thank you very much, Tim. That was awesome. And we covered a lot of ground in about 45 minutes. So it's fantastic. Uh, thank you everyone for the applause emojis coming in. Um, while people are digesting the end of that presentation, there is, okay, we've got a couple of questions coming in. Yep. This is great. Uh, maybe we'll just start from the top. Any intuition, uh, any intuition behind why the performance between four and three bit quantization is so jarring or rather why it degrades so quickly compared to the jump between eight to, to four bit? Yeah, so, so it's mostly, so uh, remember we have 16 bit inputs. And so um, basically um, the outliers are in the input matrix and the weight matrix doesn't have big outliers. But now if you multiply an outlier by a weight matrix, um, it also needs to have higher precision. And this is what we're basically seeing in these experiments. If we uh, consider the outliers plus three bit, it improves performance considerably. And so with that, we know the main problem is the outliers. Some inputs need higher precision weights than others. And that's why it's difficult to go through three bit. We can go to three bit if we consider the outliers, but it's still not optimal. Four bit gives the best results. Um, yeah, and so um, certain inputs need certain precisions, but it seems four bit is enough. If you go from eight bit and go lower, um, and the performance doesn't change. So if I go back to the previous work, we show here with eight bit, we can replicate the full performance. Actually, this also works up to six bit. And if you then go for five bit, you have a little bit of degradation and four bit is still pretty good. And as I show here, optimal, if you care about model size and three bit becomes unstable. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I think related to that, the follow-up question is any intuition that can explain why 4-bit is the optimal? That's that's like very difficult to say. Um, this, is, this is very empirical, but I cannot cannot give sort of a proof why 4-bit is optimal. Um, it's, it's very interesting, um, but... Um, yeah, it's 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 difficult to say. So for some models, we actually see that I don't have it. I think in the, in the slides, but the three bit can sometimes be as good as four bit in terms of overall efficiency. So there are some exceptions, but it's very regular for for most models. At uh, so, so I mean, and overall, we try five models, and uh, in total, like uh, basically a hundred different models with different sizes and different architectures, and only in like two or three cases, three bit is as good as four bit. So um, it's not super regular, but I mean, it, at this point, it's sort of um, very empirical. All right, so we've got a few more that have come in. Maybe we'll dive into, if we want to go further into four bit with fine tuning methodology, how can we effectively recover from quantization errors resulting from extremely low bit quantization? And we've got some extra context there. Um, yeah. So yeah, if, if we want to do that, um, so, so uh, what I show in this work is um, the quantile quantization data type. This is a data type that basically looks at the empirical and dis input distribution of the weight. So float and integer are input independent. They, they just do the same for the same weight. Um, but quantile quantization um, is actually optimized for each individual weight. And that improves the performance quite a bit on average, not, not in this case, but on average is the best data type. Now we can go to a step further, instead of empirically optimizing it for the weight, we can empirically optimize it for the input and the weight. And that is actually what uh, GPTQ does. Um, I think right now it's sort of the best quantization method. method. Um, we developed something that's a little bit better than GPTQ and sort of follow-up work. But yeah, the key part is if you want to um, improve further, you need to consider input and the weight matrix together. And for that, you need to sample some inputs, put it through the language model and sort of um, use that information. But if you have just the weight alone, it's very difficult to do better than this. Um, yeah, shall I maybe just read the questions? Or? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so then the next question um, is, um, you mentioned that perplexity is almost exactly negatively correlated uh, with zero shot learning performance. Do you think it's possible that there are other facets of immersion LLM performance not captured by zero shot performance that may uh, differ even though two models achieve the same perplexity as zero shot performance? Yes, so um, there's a little bit of a hint um, in the data that I have. So if you look here on the right plot, it sh shows a smooth exponential increase. And so you see even from um, small models that something is changing, something is changing exponentially. But if we look at this plot, it, it's sudden. And so um, this looks very similar to, for example, arithmetic performance in palm models. I think in their paper, they had a plot that at some point, so the performance is almost zero. At some point, performance of mathematical arithmetic increases rapidly. And this is, and but then they also show how this, um, um, this uh, so sort of, they show an exponential trend of some underlying dynamics that are related to arithmetic. And they find a very similar plot to this. So um, what, I, what I can say is basically, um, there are some underlying dynamics they are difficult to find, but they're exponential. If you find something that looks exponential, you know at some point it will grow so quickly that it looks like a phase shift. And so if you find something like on the right, you can say something like something on the left will happen. And so um, um, with this, um, basically you can re relate it in that way. Um, So I guess to further go into details there, um, if you want to relate zero shock performance and perplexity, you can look at exponential trends and subset of uh, perplexity data sets, and that might indicate changes in zero shock performance. 
Okay, then the next question, uh, does dynamic um, exponent data type refer to the floating point data type of the indicator bit that you've introduced in the first part of the webinar? Uh, if so, is, is losing one bit from already small four bit the reason that's performing worse than others? Um, yes, I think that sets the main thing. So um, just to go back and maybe clarify one thing here. So the main difference is that we have an exponent to the power of 10 rather than the power of two. Um, uh, or the base power is 10 instead of two. So we have um, sort of a wider range, but yeah, you're right. Basically um, the, the overall performance um, is so low because you sacrifice a single bit for, it's this plot here, a single bit for this indicator. And you only have two other bits for basically the non-sign parts. And that's just not enough to do really well. And so it's just not a good data type. And as I said, it's good for extremes if they have very large or very small values, but it's not good um, for intermediate values. And at a four bit, you need to get a good error for all kind of the entire range of data. Okay, I and think we've there, got time for one last one there. Okay. Um, there. Is there any reason to believe that the results for effective quantization schemes for inference may carry over to quantization during training? Um, yes, so, so um, I believe that um, the problem is some of these are difficult to carry over. Um, uh, sort of training is a different beast because you need to repeatedly update your weight. You need to uh, basically dequantize it while you're doing matrix multiplication. And so um, if you have sort of small block sizes, they work really well, but um, um, matrix multiplication, if you have a different block, so as you're in a matrix multiplication of inner products, and if the inner product of two vectors are separated by two blocks, and then um, their multiplication and dequantization will not result in the same output as a normal matrix multiplication. And so to do the correct thing, you need to dequantize the sub matrix multiplications and matrix multiplication on the GPU. That's very difficult to do efficiently. And so it's very difficult to, uh, to implement efficient training matrix multiplication with a certain block size on the GPU. So it could carry over, but it's too inefficient to implement. That's similar for other data types. The quantified quantization type is very efficient, but very difficult to implement for training. So it's good for inference, but for training more challenging. So in general, that's that's the trend. Um, some things work, but it's very difficult to implement them for training efficiently. And that's the main problem there. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your questions today. And thank you, Tim, for an awesome presentation and uh, giving such great answers to everyone going really in depth here. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, if you want to catch up on this, because lots of really great information covered today, replay will be up on our YouTube in about a week. Thank you again, Tim. Thank you so much for joining and sharing today. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.